Welcome to a video on what I think the top five mistakes that I see new Flutter developers doing. Uh, one way that I've been seeing this is I've been active on the Flutter Help subreddit and I see these as common patterns that uh, people are doing and there's a lot of things in Flutter that make your life really, really easy and they're not doing them. So the point of this video is just so, you know, if you find yourself doing something in Flutter and it feels a little awkward or feels a little difficult, Flutter's supposed to be easy and there's almost always a tool to make it really easy for you. Uh, so here's the first thing that I see people doing is defining inline themes all over the place. So here we have a screen and it's got a scaffold background color, it's got a nap bar, it's got textiles, it's got input decorations and it's got an elevated button with a particular rounded rectangle border and uh, border radius. Now that's all great and it's good to style your stuff. It's also got a floating action button to make the, everything look the way that you want it to. But you do this with one screen and then you make another screen and you realize that it actually has a whole bunch of different colors again. So maybe you just copy and paste this stuff and you put that there and then eventually you have like 10, 20 screens in your app and somebody says, hey, what if floating action buttons weren't blue anymore? What if those were red? And what if the rounded rectangle border, what if that border was thinner and all this stuff? And you realize that changing that stuff is going to take an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of work and you're going to have to be very, very thorough and change every single instance of every single theme all over your app. So that's what this screen looks like uh, when you define all the themes in a row, in line, sorry. So what can we do instead? We can just use a themed screen. So you see everything is gone from here. It's very likely that if you want a particular color of app bar and you want a particular color of scaffold or you want a particular color of floating action button, that everywhere, at least in that section of the app, maybe in the entire app, you want them to be all the same and you want to have that happen for free. So pretty much every single material widget that can be styled looks up their style via theme. So let's look at main and see how that can be done. So you can see all that code. It's still the same amount of code, right? I still have to put in all my colors and my textiles that I want and my button theme data. And it's a bit of work to get this all set up, but you do it once and everything in your whole material app is going to style the way that you want it. And if somebody says, hey, what if floating action buttons are red? You can do that in two seconds. And if this is in line like this, instead of being constant, you can just hot reload and show them what red is gonna look like. It's so, so much faster. It's much, much better to define everything in a theme. You can even have multiple themes within your app and uh, you know define those and then have inner themes uh, throughout your app if you want something to be different. But pretty much every time you are coloring something or changing the uh, border radius, you can instead do that in theme, the amount of things in theme is absolutely insane. You can change almost everything in the entire material library as far as colors and text themes and boldness and brightness and all that sort of stuff. The next mistake that I see is people reinventing the wheel. So whenever you do something in software, you wanna look at what people have done before. Maybe there's a plugin you can use, maybe it's paid or not. Maybe there's just examples of how you could do something. And if you're inventing things uh, often, you're gonna make a lot of things harder for yourself and you might have end up being maintaining an entire library of stuff that uh, you could get for free elsewhere. So whenever you wanna do something in uh, Flutter, it's pretty likely that somebody's done it before. So what you can do, just go to Google. I want a loading indicator with pretty animations. You just go there and you can see that Flutter has built-in loading indicators and there is even a loading indicator package with a whole bunch of different loading indicators that you can just use completely for free. And this applies to so, so many things in Flutter. Um, if you're finding yourself building things from scratch that don't really need to be built from scratch, like you could adapt these and change the colors and change the sizes and stuff like that. Um, just take a step back and think, do I really need to completely reinvent this? Because when you reinvent that, you're also gonna have to maintain that yourself. And this library is of course maintained by somebody else. And if you depend on multiple libraries like this, then you're getting an awful lot of stuff completely for free. The next mistake that I see that is probably the most common is dealing with raw JSON. You do not need to write any manually parsing code for JSON unless it's a very special case. And even then you can still use generated files from the JSON serializable package to help you with that. So here's an article about um, complex JSON and it goes over a couple of examples and they get easier. Sorry, they start off pretty easy. Like if you wanted to parse this directly, you know, you could enter in the key like this and then you know it's a list and then you could parse that into a list of strings but then it gets a little more complicated and you see that some of these are actually objects as well nested within. So you can do stuff like this in Flutter, right? You could go response and then go this and then the first one and then elements and blah, blah, blah. And they're right, it's not too crazy. But then once you get things that are large enough in JSON, it becomes next to impossible to actually parse this stuff out 
on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Well, it's not impossible, right, because somebody wrote a JSON parsing library, but again, well, along the theme of reinventing the wheel, there is a package to generate you files to do this for you. So you don't need to write out anything like this. So let's look at JSON serializable flutter. All right, this is one of the most important packages to get to know how to use. You can define your class as a strongly typed class and it has first name and last name. And what it's gonna do is generate you files with the from JSON and to JSON and it can do extremely complicated things like lists of objects, maps with objects in them and those objects might have lists. You can model pretty much anything you can get in JSON with this uh, JSON serializable. And if there is something unique that you need to do, you can annotate it with a JSON key and tell it how to do it just for that one field. So the vast majority of it is still automatic for you. The next thing that I see people do wrong, which in this example is gonna be pretty specific to Firebase, but it applies to everything, is not using the power of a type safe language to make things type safe. The reason that type safe is so much better uh, is because if you add a field here, anything that tried to make a user is no longer gonna compile because there's gonna be an extra field there. And that's a good thing because if this user is a model of something that goes to and from the internet and you have it defined with raw maps everywhere, if you add a key to one of those maps, your user is now gonna have an address. But if you miss adding it somewhere, uh, it's not gonna get added in certain ways. Or if you miss adding it somewhere, maybe that command will actually delete the address and you're gonna have really weird bugs that are hard to figure out. So in uh, this example, we have a user and it's strongly typed. It's got JSON serializable. It's got an ID and a username and it's got the to and from JSON here. And let's look at two services. So here's our bad user service. And this one is using Firebase Firestore. So Firestore has a collection of documents. And when you access this collection of users, what you can get is a document snapshot. And document snapshots have this thing called data. And what I've seen a lot of people do is use this data as a map and then they access all of the keys with hard-coded strings. And this data is effectively JSON, right? It's a document storage, so it's a JSON object. And what we can do is tell Firestore what type this is with the power of um, our to JSON and from JSON from our models and have it do everything for us. So what comes out of data is our user class and we don't need to do anything like this. So let's look at what we can do with Firestore specifically here. So here's a type safe service. So along with making it type safe, I've also injected this as a dependency in here. So that's a lot better because for unit testing, that's a lot better. So it takes a little bit more work to get started here. So what we're gonna have to do is define our collection with a converter. And when we use a converter, we can give it what type we want that data of that document to map to. In order to map it, we need a from Firestore and a to Firestore. So from Firestore, it takes a snapshot. The options is unused here. There's some other extra stuff you can do. And from JSON, all we gotta do is give it that data. And then to Firestore, all we gotta do is user.toJSON. And then from then on, this collection reference has this generic type of user, and that is strongly typed. So when we go .get, .get is now gonna give us a document snapshot of the type user. So then we can just go user.id. We don't need to do anything with the JSON anymore because that's all packed into our user from JSON and to JSON here. The last mistake that I see people doing, and it's really fair that they make it because all the document uh, documentation has this, is using the widget future builder for anything that comes from the internet. Uh, so it seems pretty innocent because it's in the documentation for both Flutter and Firestore. So we go down and we get something from the internet eventually and then we want to display it on the screen. And what we, they show us is they use a future builder and they put that request to the API right in here with the future. And then they look at stuff like snapshot.data, has error, and by default it shows a spinner. And then similarly in the Firestore documentation, it says, well, if you want this once, just use a future builder, get your document snapshot, and then do something with that. If it has an error, something went wrong, if it exists, blah, blah, blah. And then in here, you see that they actually didn't model out their class, even though Firestore itself has the capability of doing this. So this is leading people to doing really, really bad things because Future Builder uh, does not help you with your state management of your app. So let's picture, you have this widget here and you get your user. Let's say this is like a user profile screen. And then you go to some other screen and it has a user's list and this user appears there and you go to some other screen and it has a profile image. What you want in your app is one single source of truth for things like state of users. So if you change the user on this screen, 
what a uh, real user person is going to expect when they're using their app is that if they go to a different screen and they modify this, like they change their profile picture, that that other screen has that profile picture if they change their username that it changed because there should only be one source of truth for that user. And this does not lead you to being able to do that because you get your user here and then it just disappears as soon as you leave this screen. So yes, you could fetch it every single time that you want to use it, but that's not great either because if you have a large app with a whole bunch of different objects, you don't want to fetch every single user and company and task and to do every single time that you need to display anything. You'd like to encapsulate that in some sort of state management system. So here I've got an example. We have bad future builder. This is exactly pretty much what they have here. So we have a future builder. We get that user and then you know we show their username. But once you leave the screen, this user just disappears. So let's look at a better solution. And this solution, I'm going to use block. Now, you don't have to use block. Like block is one of the most popular um, state management uh, strategies. But of course, you can use Redux. You can use provider. You could use uh, Riverpod. There's all sorts of different solutions for this that all ultimately want to do something pretty similar, which is restrict the ways that you can access state so that you can uh, have really well-defined ways that your state is changing and then make it so that there's a single source of truth for things like a user. So here we have a user builder. This is um, taking in an ID. And right here, we get our reference to our users block. And then in init state, we can load user, right? When we look at the bad future builder, let's split this over here, right? We're just getting that document and the user interface is interacting with our database layer, like our Firestore directly. And this is not very good either because this is really hard to unit test because the user interface could just do anything to our Firestore collection in any undefined way. And if we have a bug there, that's gonna be really hard to figure out why that's happening. Whereas if we put this into a user, uh, sorry, a state management system, we know the different things that a user block can do. And those are the only things that the UI can ever call. So it makes it really, really easy to say, you know, these are the discrete things that I'm allowing my user to do to the user's collection and um, unit test those. So here we init state, we load the user. And what this is going to do when we use a block is we're, that's going to put it into state um, for our user's block for all other widgets too. So it's going to refresh that user. So here we can uh, look at this block builder. So block builder is specific to the block plugin, but most of these state management uh, plugins have something pretty similar, which is that you're building the UI based on the state of your app. And what this is going to give us also is what's called reactive UI. So imagine somebody else edited this user. Well, we're getting it once. So this screen is not going to live update, right? Even if we are the ones that changed it somehow, uh, this screen is not going to live update because we get it and then we don't do anything else again. Um, this also has a really bad issue because it's getting it every single time that the screen rebuilds because it's calling get repeatedly. So here we get it once because it's an init state. And then if something were to change in our user state, this screen is going to rebuild because block builder knows to rebuild when our state changes. So we're going to have state.has error here and loading user. And very similarly, we're going to build that list tile. But because I've got my user state with my strongly typed user, I can just go user.username. I don't need to access JSON in the UI. This is also really, really, really bad. I think it's pretty unfortunate. This is in the documentation for Firestore because I've seen people have issues with this quite a bit. So this tutorial isn't about the uh, actually how to use block. It's just an example. But the point is you really want to have one source of truth for your state and whatever state management strategy you want to use. It's important to use it to the full extent and have all of your users live in like a user state and have one source of truth for those and a defined way that your UI is going to interact with that state.